Today is August 24th, 2021. For most of you, this day is just another day. But in tech history, today marks the anniversary of the biggest jump in the history of personal computing. 20 years ago, Microsoft Windows XP was released to the world, becoming the most popular operating system as well as the best remembered legacy operating system to this very day. I have gathered a variety of experts from all over the world to reflect on the impact and the legacy of Windows XP. I'm Edvardi J and this is Windows XP at 20, a documentary. It all traces back to 1999. Microsoft had created a roadmap for the future of its operating systems. Windows Millennium Edition was already set out for release and all that was needed was a couple of bug fixes before it was shipped out to retailers worldwide. While they were doing that though, Microsoft had a bigger idea in mind. Windows Neptune and Windows Odyssey. Windows Neptune, as it was codenamed, was planned to be the next major operating system, initially planned to succeed Windows Millennium Edition. Based on Windows 2000, Windows Neptune was set to replace the Windows 9X series of operating systems and become the first consumer OS based on NT code. Though it largely resembled Windows 2000 in virtually every way, Windows Neptune experimented with new features like the unused activity center and a graphical logon screen that looks very similar to the one used in Windows XP. Unfortunately, Windows Odyssey didn't have nearly as much outsourced to the public, so we know very little of it. However, it is said that it was based also on Windows 2000 and experimented with the Activity Center as well. That being said, Windows Neptune might have been the planned consumer release, while Windows Odyssey might have been the business release, something that Microsoft was known for doing at the time. In early 2000, however, the Windows Neptune development team merged with the Odyssey development team to form a larger project. This one was codenamed Whistler. During this time, Microsoft had planned out its entire set of releases. They were codenamed Whistler, Longhorn, and Blackcomb. Longhorn turned into Vista and Blackcomb turned into Windows 7. Whistler and Blackcomb are two mountains in a ski resort in Canada, while Longhorn was a bar that sat in the middle at the base of Whistler Mountain. How fitting. Whistler's goal was to unite the business and consumer editions of Windows under one NT platform, unifying the user experience between the two. Technology writer Paul Thurot said that Neptune had become a black hole when all the features that were cut from Windows Millennium Edition were simply retagged as Neptune features. And since Windows Neptune and Odyssey would be based on the same code base anyway, it made sense to combine them into a single project. At the Windows Hardware Engineering Conference of 2000, Microsoft officially announced and showcased a very early build of the Whistler operating system. This build featured a brand new architecture, built-in CD burning, and fast user switching. It also boasted upgraded features that were built into Windows Me, like Windows Media Player and Windows Movie Maker. Windows General Manager Call Stork said that there were plans to make the interface warmer and more friendly, and that surely was what they did later in the year when they showcased the watercolor theme. Showcased at PDC 2000, Microsoft showcased build 2250, which boasted the professional theme, which was later known as watercolor. It was made to be a decoy while Microsoft worked on the all too familiar Luna theme. As for features, it included an early version of the Windows Firewall as well as the early version of the two column start menu that we would see shipped with XP. However, this is hidden. It also had a hidden start page, similar to the Neptune starting places. Windows Whistler's next notable update was build 2257 in which they added refinements to the watercolor theme, Windows Firewall, and officially introduced the two column start menu. The next build of note was build 2410, in which they introduced Internet Explorer 6.0 as well as the Microsoft Activation System, as seen in earlier Windows versions. 
It was then that Bill Gates said that they would release the consumer version of Whistler first and then Whistler Server later, but both in the latter half of 2001. However, Whistler Server did not get released until 2003, in which it became Windows Server 2003. Lastly, Build 2419 introduced the last element that would be seen in Windows XP, solidifying the setup UI and finally using the Bliss wallpaper. The development of Windows XP would finally come to its end on February 5th of 2001, when Windows Whistler was showcased and announced to the world. But this time, it was released as Windows XP, with XP meaning experience. In addition, they showcased the next version of Microsoft Office, called Office XP. In June of 2001, Microsoft began its Yes We Can campaign. Wait. Nope, wrong campaign. Microsoft began its Yes You Can campaign. Initially, the campaign was going to be named Prepared to Fly, but it was swiftly scrapped in the wake of the 9-11 terror attacks. Microsoft aired many commercials about XP using Madonna's song Ray of Light. It was chosen for its complimentary theme and message for the campaign. And finally, on this day, 20 years ago, Windows XP Build 2600 was released to manufacturing to ship with brand new computers around the world. But these manufacturers couldn't ship the new computers until September 24th, and consumers still couldn't buy copies. It wouldn't hit retail shelves until October 25th, 2001, where Microsoft announced the two major editions, Home and Professional. Since its release in 2001, Windows XP has had several editions like Starter, Media Center Edition, Mobile 2003, Server 2003, and XP Embedded. So now, let's do a deep dive into the operating system, shall we? To make this film easier to digest, we split up the history into a total of five sections, the first of which being called the Wake Era. What was going on during this time? When Windows XP shipped in 2001, it had brand new elements. These included a graphical install user interface with music composed by none other than Halo composer Stan Lepard. Many people would consider it a classic, and no doubt it is. The composer is often miscredited as Brian Enyo, as he had done similar music for Microsoft like the Windows 95 startup sound, but in fact, the true composer was Stan Lepard. Stan Lepard worked on other music projects for Microsoft and composed for the game Halo as well. His death was publicly announced on February 14, 2021 by his colleague who said he had died the week prior. Windows XP also had a brand new look when booted into the operating system when compared to its predecessors. Finally, we saw the friendly green and blue color palette and a brand new wallpaper, Bliss. With this, Windows XP had its look and feel solidified at last, and just two months after release, it had sold 17 million copies. This broke sales records, first set by Windows 95, however, Windows XP would lose its title to Windows Vista by selling 20 million copies in one month. Upon its release, Windows XP received praise from critics, with critics noting increased performance and stability, a friendlier user interface, better hardware support, and more multimedia capabilities. Service Pack 1 for Windows XP was released on the 9th of September 2002. It fixed over 300 bugs in the original release, as well as added USB 2.0 support, Java, and support for the Net Framework. Service Pack 1 also introduced the Set Program Access and Defaults page into the Control Panel, in which you can disable Microsoft Bloatware and set custom default programs. But, why would Microsoft even do that though? Don't they want their bloatware to stay? Well, this was done to comply with terms set in a settlement. 
United States versus Microsoft was a case in which Microsoft was being forced to dissolve and split into smaller entities due to accusations by the US government of having a monopoly on the computer software world. Without going into detail, because Microsoft bundled Office and Internet Explorer with computers, other companies like Netscape, who ran a web browser called Netscape Navigator, were at a massive disadvantage. Who could possibly compete with Microsoft? A year later, on the 24th of April 2003, Microsoft released Windows Server 2003. Derived from Windows XP, this was the first server-focused OS to be a part of the Windows NT family of operating systems. The UI was very basic and flat, similar to its 9x predecessors, but it included newer features that helped individuals run their servers. Its most helpful feature was the watchdog timer, in which it restarts the server if the operating system does not respond within a set amount of time. Windows Server 2003 had four major additions. Web for web-based applications and websites, Standard for regular server use, Enterprise for medium to large businesses, and Data Center for infrastructures that needed high security and reliability. It also included a backup system as a way to recover lost files. Other than that, it was just Windows XP, just with um, new software aimed at servers. Following this, we received Windows Mobile 2003. Becoming the first OS to be called Windows Mobile, it was built upon Windows Compact Edition 4.20, which itself was based on Windows XP. Released on the 23rd of June 2003, Windows Mobile 2003 was focused toward the compact PC and PDA side of computing. Emergence While it's hard to pinpoint an exact time, I have reason to believe XP's emergence was from 2004 to 2009 as a lot had happened between those years. Here's a basic rundown of what was going on at this time. Microsoft had a lot on their hands. At the time, they were working on Windows Vista, or as it was codenamed, Longhorn. Based on Windows XP's codebase, Windows Longhorn was set to be the successor to Windows XP as a mid-term release while they planned features for Windows Blackcomb. But while Windows Longhorn was being built, people were jumping all over Windows XP. News references of Windows XP began to spike and many fan-made projects were being released or put under development. Windows XP Media Center Edition 2005, codenamed Symphony, was released on the 12th of October 2004 and added new features to Windows Movie Maker and Windows Media Player. It also included the Royale theme, additional wallpapers and screensavers, and support from Microsoft's custom remote and keyboard for Media Center PCs. Alongside Media Center 2005, Microsoft released XP Tablet PC Edition 2005 and Starter Edition. Tablet PC Edition 2005 was built around the focus of touchscreen devices, such as the newly released Microsoft Tablet PC, among many others. Nothing much was changed other than a slightly modified user interface with bigger buttons and drivers for touchscreen support. Meanwhile, Windows XP Starter Edition was a stripped-down version of Windows XP Home Edition that was focused on low-end hardware in developing countries. However, this edition was a bit different to the other ones. The visual style resembles that of the Windows 9X series, and the Luna theme cannot be used, that is, without modifying the Windows registry. The user cannot run more than three programs and no more than three iterations of a program. It will not boot on faster CPUs and will not recognize more than 256 megabytes of RAM. This might have been because Microsoft didn't want people to opt in for Starter Edition just because it's cheaper especially when they had the hardware capacity to run regular Windows XP. A small watermark that will read, Windows XP Starter Edition will sit at the lower left hand corner of the screen. You could say that Windows XP Starter Edition was a bit limited, sort of like what happens when you don't activate Windows 10. Also, it was around this time that Microsoft Longhorn had gone through its reset. The teams of the Longhorn development team had finally banded together and were ready to work on the next version of Windows. Now instead of being based on Windows XP Professional, Longhorn was being built upon the Server 2003 codebase. This made things a lot easier for the devs. 
Rolling over into 2005, we start off with Windows XP Professional X64 Edition. Released on the 25th of April 2005, Professional X64 was released to add support for x86 to x84 architectures. So now, you might be wondering, wait, didn't you talk already about Windows XP Professional? Well, XP Professional is a bit different from Professional X64. On the surface, aside from the branded wallpaper, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And that isn't by accident. It's on the inside that counts. Let's have Windows on Windows tell you about it. What do we know? The difference between Windows XP Professional and Professional X64 or 64-bit edition. Windows XP Professional X64 or 64-bit edition introduced support for up to 128GB of RAM, two CPUs, as well as up to 64 processors. Professional X64 is also based on Windows Server 2003, as opposed to Windows XP Professional, and therefore benefits from some of the features introduced in Server 2003, such as the latest update of IPsec. This is a network protocol that provides encrypted communication between computers over virtual private networks. It also introduced a technology called Windows on Windows 64-bit, or WoW 64, which allows software originally written for 32-bit systems to run on 64-bit PCs, and is still present today in the 32-bit edition of Windows 10. Thank you Windows on Windows! Following the release of Windows XP Professional X64, we got Windows Embedded for Point of Service. Released on the 24th of May 2005, it was based on XP Service Pack 2, and expanded the Windows Embedded line of operating systems, as well as making deployment of these onto systems such as ATMs much easier, by including the ability to update an already deployed image. Additionally, Windows Mobile 5.0 was released on May the 9th, 2005, at a Microsoft conference aimed at mobile devices in Las Vegas, Nevada. However, Windows XP seemed to be reaching its end as Microsoft continued to work on its successor, finally choosing the name Windows Vista on the 22nd of June, 2005. Moving through 2006, on the 8th of July, Microsoft released the Windows Fundamentals for Legacy PCs, or FLP for short. FLP, being based on Windows Embedded, was optimised for legacy PC makers and was designed to work faster on older hardware. It used up less system resources than standard XP, and therefore got rid of a lot of the bloatware included in XP. However, the basics like networking, support for peripherals and support for DirectX were left intact. Just months after this, development on the new OS was finished in November of 2006 and Windows Vista was set to release on the 30th of January 2007. Except, things didn't go according to plan. Here's why. For most people, their computers weren't ready to run Vista at its full capacity, and so Vista seemed… buggy. In addition, newer PCs that had the capability to run Windows Vista would have the label Vista Capable. However, when they installed it, they experienced issues like graphical glitches because their systems were too slow. This made consumers wonder, is this all a scam? For the exorbitant $239 price tag, I wouldn't be surprised if they thought it was. This lack of clarity eventually led to a class action lawsuit against Microsoft on the basis of misleading advertisement, and so, everyone crawled back to Windows XP. Rolling on to another year, on the 21st of April 2008, Microsoft released XP Service Pack 3, and that provided updates to every bundled Microsoft application for Windows XP. It was also around then that the final version of Enlight, a customization software to make custom Windows XP ISO files was released, making it possible to modify a Windows XP installation to include what you want. On the 30th of June 2008, 17 months after the release of Windows Vista, 
Microsoft stopped licensing Windows XP to OEMs and terminated sales in retail for good. This began the end of life sequence for mainstream Windows XP. Windows XP Embedded Standard was released in October of 2008 as a newer release to its 2001 counterpart, XP Embedded. This was because Vista did not have a componentized edition. Following this, on the 8th of December 2008, Windows XP POS Ready 2009 was released, making it the last entry in the Windows XP line of operating systems. With Windows 7's release over the horizon in just a few months, this was only just the beginning for the end of Windows XP. On April 19th, 2009, Seven years, seven months, and 21 days in, Windows XP lost mainstream support, and this began the death sequence of Windows XP. By March of 2010, Internet Explorer 6, the browser that came pre-installed with Windows XP, lost support from Google. This made Internet Explorer 6 considerably less useful. This edition of Internet Explorer had already been criticized by PC World though. They criticized it for being the least secure software on the planet and frequently put it on list as one of the worst softwares of all time. In August of 2012, Windows XP was dethroned from being the most widely used operating system. This is according to web analytics data generated from Net Applications, a firm that tracks web analytics. However, the company has admitted that their statistics may be skewed so take that with a bit of salt. A more reliable source cited by web analytics website StatCounter indicates that it happened a year earlier. The final nail in the coffin though was on the 8th of April, 2014, and here in New York, it was a cold and raining day. How fitting. Besides the melodramatic weather though, it was the day that Windows XP was finally laid to rest. Pop-up messages appeared on consumers' computers as far back as March 3rd, according to a ZDNet article, and I fondly remember this happening on my mom's computer as well. But the day had finally come. Tech YouTube had gone on an overload, as they paid homage to an operating system that had seen it all. From 9-11 and the internet explosion in popularity, to the beginning of modern websites and the beginning of development, on HTML5. Being a part of our childhoods and our first PC moments, they all shared fond memories. So I've gathered three very amazing YouTubers here to talk about their memories. So I'm actually in quite a unique position where I never actually had Windows XP at home despite being perfectly the right age for it. Just uh, my mother didn't believe in the importance of an internet connection at home so I kind of had a millennium edition PC growing up and then I just had no computer at all until eventually uh, my dad got a Windows Vista that I could use on <laughs> occasion and you know, by the time I had my own proper laptop to call something myself um, that was in Windows 7 era. So uh, Windows XP, I never had my own device on it, but it was still such a staple anyway. Like all of the school PCs were, were Windows XP. Uh, you could go into a library well, well into the, the peak of like 7, 8 and 10's lifespan. And you could probably to this day still find some PCs in like a library or something that's running XP. It's clearly like one of the most impactful uh, OS uh, operating systems that I can think of. You know, everyone had XP. Even I, who didn't have XP, still used loads of XP just by going to school. Um, so, you know, I've only ever, for example, had good experiences with Vista because they've kind of worked it out by the time that I tried it. And then uh, Millennium Edition gets knocked a lot as well, but I never had 98, so I thought Millennium Edition was good too. But XP, it's just one of the most universally liked platforms and it's, it's definitely got my seal of approval too. 
Hi everyone, this is MajorSky17, creator of the Windows on Windows video series on YouTube in which I explore the development of the world's most widely used operating system, Microsoft Windows. And whilst Windows XP wasn't the first version of Windows I used, a fact which makes me feel slightly old, it nevertheless holds a very special place in my childhood memories and it was for this reason that the first series of videos I created on my channel was focused on its development. So my family got a Packard Bell Windows 98 SE machine, if I remember correctly, in late 1999 and whilst I had used Windows 3.1 and Windows 95 briefly before this at friends houses and so on, this was my first real experience of using a computer on a daily basis and I really loved it so I tried out all the programs customized you know all the settings played some really great games and definitely broke windows many many times of course Windows 9x being the uh, the temple of stability that it is but anyway I digress slightly so a couple of years later when Windows XP came out I remember one of my friends got it on his PC first and I was absolutely infatuated it looked so colorful so modern with its new theme new icons not to mention the new start menu you know it really did look um, amazing compared to what we'd been used to using up to that point uh, I literally could not look away and immediately I started basically begging my parents for us to get a new computer so that I could use it myself at home uh, eventually we did of course and I have so many fond memories of using Windows XP in the early 2000s right up until Windows Vista came out during that time, I also got my first laptop, which ran Windows XP Media Center Edition, which again to me was very exciting with its slightly tweaked theme, giving it a bit of a facelift, which was a nice touch, I think. So for more information on Windows XP and the development of other versions of Windows, such as 95 and Vista, check out my YouTube channel. And if you like what you see, be sure to subscribe to be notified when each new episode is uploaded. Once again, this is MajorSky17. Thank you for listening. So, Edvardi on his channel asked me to talk about Windows XP, and honestly, I don't have much experience with it because I used my parents' old computers from like the 1900s and early 2000s, um, so I didn't have that, and then I used Mac at school while Windows XP was a thing and then I started using like Windows 10 so I kind of skipped over the whole um, Windows XP thing but my grandparents did have it and I use their computers sometimes so honestly I guess it's kind of a middle ground between the two I don't know what else to say like the old ones that I used at first were like very weak and like straightforward um there was nothing super fancy about it the one i had though had a lot of games on it it was really fun i played this thing called um pipe dream oh my god that was my favorite game it was like this like green goop was coming through pipes and like you were trying to race to like figure out how to um create a little pipe for them for the goo to go on before time ran out or be before the goo got there it was a lot of fun there was like golf and i also played the cards except every every computer has those cards games now it's just i've never seen pipe dream except now on the internet um so that was fun i also typed a lot of things on word i was a huge typer as a kid i would just copy stuff i would like use excel and like do like color schemes it was a good time <laughs> being a kid was fun i didn't have like these cool apps on my phone or tablet i actually just used excel and you know typed numbers like a scroll like one two three four five six seven eight nine ten i think i got up to like somewhere in the high thousands to be honest <laughs> it was a lot um yeah i just kept typing that and it was so much fun and I practiced my typing, which actually came in handy a lot. I also did computer games, like, with actual, like, discs. We would put into the computer and, you know, play them from the disc. That was fun. I bet we would have done that on Windows XP too, but of course, now we don't do that. You know, the computers are so much more... 
I don't know. Honestly, it's not about discs anymore. It's about Steam and, you know, the internet and downloading games onto your computer through the App Store. Um, so we don't really use discs anymore, but I'm sure I could have it work if I really wanted to learn TTL3 on my computer. <laughs> so, it worked pretty well for the most part. I think that if I were to use it now, it would be like almost easier to use in Windows 10. Sometimes I'm still confused on how to search stuff even, like I have to type stuff, not just scroll through a list. It's kind of confusing and I would say Windows XP would probably be a lot easier to use than Windows 10 just because it's a lot simpler and I don't need all the fancy gadgets that's on Windows 10. Plus, I can't use um, Word and uh, what's it called? Microsoft Office basically on Windows 10 because I didn't buy it yet, but I do have the other version, maybe 2007? I'm not sure. But I have the old one, but not the new one, so now I have to use it through my school and it's just complicated. I wish I could just go back and use the 2007 one, but it's not compatible, so. Yeah, honestly, at that point, I just want to go back to the way it was, but I do have a Windows 10 computer, there's nothing you can do about that, and that is my take on Windows XP and its comparison to the generation, generations before and after Windows XP. A huge thanks to the three of you for your amazing help in this project. It's been an honor working with all of you. You would think this would be the end of the show, right? Well, you'd be wrong. Windows XP's legacy continued to live on. While people began to switch over to Windows 7 and Windows 8.1, people stayed true to their roots and stuck with Windows XP for just a bit longer. The Decline 2015 XP was just 14 years old and was getting ready to start high school. Except, it couldn't start high school because it was already dead. Now we take you to TXM Overseas to tell you about it. With the release of the first iteration of Windows 10 coming up in mere months, 2015 proved to be a very eventful year. With Windows XP off its hands, the devs could now work on a more daunting task. The proclaimed final version of Windows, Windows 10. Still, people were still using Windows XP for their systems. Why was that? Well, simply put, Windows XP still had support after its end of support, but it was for one market only, the embedded market. Internet payphones, ATMs, banks, automated displays at airports, and medical equipment around the globe still relied heavily on embedded systems and therefore crawled back onto Windows XP. Specifically, Windows POS Ready 2009. Becoming the last version of Windows XP to be supported, while its successor, Windows Vista, and Windows 8 were both laid to rest, Windows POS Ready became the oldest operating system to actively be supported by Microsoft. People exploited this by applying hotfixes and patches to the window registry that allowed Windows XP. But sadly, all good things must come to an end. Right, side note, is it just me or is like every other Windows version going to be a failure? First we had Windows Me, then we had Vista, then we had Windows 8, which was a complete failure. Like, it's really interesting to think about anyways, you know. Like I was saying, all good things must come to an end, because on the 9th of April 2019, Windows POS Ready 2009 became the oldest supported iteration of Windows as it drew its last breath at midnight. Just like that, after 17 years, 7 months, and 16 days of being on people's computers, Windows XP was gone. Never to be updated again. That's right. Now you could call this the proper end of life or XP's second death, but truth be told, it wasn't commemorated nearly as much as the 2014 Eternariant. But the storm isn't over, there's one thing left. And that part will be narrated by a good friend of mine. Take it away, Samantha. 2020 was without a doubt a terrible time in history. But there's one thing that happened this year that came as a shock. And that was the Windows XP source leak. 
In the midst of the pandemic, source code for Windows XP Service Pack 1 and Windows Service 2003 were leaked on 4chan on the 23rd of September 2020. Through this, users compiled the code themselves and built it from source. One even went as far as to upload the process onto YouTube. However, the videos were removed by Microsoft on the grounds of copyright infringement. Still, the source code got shared on torrent networks and later, files of all sorts were circulating. This could mean that perhaps Windows XP is in dead after all, and hopefully a fan project will come out very soon. Thank you, and sadly my friends, this is where the story ends. From its humble beginnings to its triumphant end with fans all over the world hooked into the immeasurable influence of the blue and green. This has been an Edvardi J production. Thank you for watching. Till next.